Administration and Ways and Means Committee, so you can see how important both his connections with the legislature and the, and the uh, positions that he held uh, are to a board like ours. Uh, he's also been a financial planner for 35 years, been involved in many civic and uh, public policy organizations, Edina Chamber of Commerce, Ducks Unlimited, Edina Rotary, and he's a graduate uh, of the University of Minnesota and a combat veteran. So welcome Ron to the board. He'll be a real asset to us. Uh, the, uh, the other two are Jay, J uh, Jeff Hegard, who is the uh, executive director of a thousand Friends of Minnesota and grew up in western Minnesota near the lakes area of Alexandria. Uh, he and his uh, siblings own a farm and seasonal lakeshore property in Douglas County. And he joined because uh, of his concern uh, about the current property tax system in Minnesota. Uh, so it's good to have him on there. He's a hunter. Uh, he's a founder, founding partner of two for-profit companies and has a variety of, uh, of non-profit and foundation boards. So he's uh, well-versed in uh, a lot of different areas that will help on our board. The third new member would be Ted Johnson. His family's owned uh, property in, on Lake Washington or Washburn in southern Cass County since before he was born. He and his wife own a, a cabin on Lake Washburn as well as 40 acres around there. So he's, you know, his family's been involved in lakeshore property and, and those issues for all of his life and then be even before him. So, and he's also concerned about the current tax policy. So we have uh, three good people coming on board and, and I'd, I'd like to thank Jeff for, for getting people of such quality to serve on the board and to round out uh, the board so that we're competent in all areas because you can't have too many people that are too much alike from from the same you know areas and that kind of thing uh, it, it's nice to have somebody in competence in all areas so we welcome all three new board members and especially Ron for for being here tonight thank you Without notes. <laughs> I dressed up for the annual meeting. Um, we are also losing three board members this year um, who have uh, um, really been a big asset to the organization. Um, the first I'd like to rec uh, recognize is Dale, who is our president since 2005, I think 2005. And Dale's uh, um, just been great. I, I've really come to respect and rely upon his input in our issues as we kind of move forward. Um, a founding member and past president, uh, Jack Chafee, his son was a lobbyist for us for a time and he was here right from the beginning. Um, he's retiring from the MSR PO, PO board. Um, and then George Colburn, who has a great deal of experience in sort of lake association issues and lake issues. Um, is also resigning, and um, uh, we're going to miss those three a, a lot. Um, and uh, I don't see, is, is Henry in the room? I don't see Henry right now. I'll introduce Henry to you later. Um, and Judy, who you met out front, and really without them, we'd be sunk. So um, if you see them, uh, meet them and thank them, and, and uh, uh, if you have any questions for Henry, he's a, he's a good source. Um, and now, oh, there's Judy, right here. Uh, and now for our guest speakers. Uh, <clears throat> first, we have Dean Current, who is going to talk to us about carbon credits. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about carbon cap and trade systems and carbon credits. In Europe and other parts of the world, greenhouse gas emissions like carbon are capped through an agreement, and then markets are used to allocate emissions among the regulated sources. Those polluters who are able to adjust their business and reduce emissions below the set level can then sell the carbon they are not emitting to those that are emitting more carbon than their cap allows. In addition, others can get credits, called carbon reduction credits, 
by collecting and sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. They can then sell these credits in the industry marketplace. Uh, the most direct way of doing this is by growing trees. Um, half the weight of wood fiber is carbon. This carbon stored in the forest growing on our land can then be sold on the international carbon market. Currently, the United States does not have a cap and trade system. Still, landowners can make money off the carbon being sequestered on their land today through the international markets. The Chicago Climate Exchange was created a few years ago, and there are private landowners in Minnesota today who are already selling credits. Whether you agree with the effort or not, the fact is that the United States is poised to enter into this international market with the Waxman-Markley Bill, which includes cap and trade provisions. Um, when or if we do, the price of these credits will go up considerably. Um, even if the United States does not end up adopting a cap and trade system, there is still a viable source of revenue to be gained from the European market in carbon credits. Um, Dean uh, Current from the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources has a lot of experience in agroforestry. He is also the program director for the Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Agricultural Management. Uh, Dean has done a lot of work with carbon credits the last few years and probably knows more about how they work on private lands than anyone in the state. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dean Kern. Great. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I always uh, enjoy the chance to get out and talk to folks about this and hear what other people are thinking about it, too. And I think Jeff asked me to talk about some of the opportunities that might be coming up in terms of uh, the, the carbon market and how that might help landowners. And we really, I've looked at it kind of saying, you know, we have this potential for this market. How can we use it to better manage our lands in Minnesota? And in your case, uh, you know, provide income to people that are doing a good job and uh, stewarding the, those lands. Uh, first time I met Jeff was, uh, I think, in January in Cloquet. We were talking about global warming, and it was 20 below that day. So it wasn't the best subject in the best weather for that. But, uh, but that's kind of one of the things that's given rise to this whole issue of the you know, the carbon market, the carbon credits, as a way to address the, the global warming and the climate change issues. And uh, I don't want to go into that much more, as Jeff suggested, you know, what is that market looking like right now, and where is it going? So, uh, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about carbon credits, what kind of the, the reasoning behind carbon credits is. Uh, what the markets are, what they're doing, what we see, we look forward to them doing in the future. Um, then some of the options there might be as a result of this market for forest landowners in terms of being able to improve uh, their ability to manage lands and then some of the issues and future work and I always tell people I've been doing this these kind of talks for about two years and uh, usually I say you know what I tell you today will probably change in three months and six months and it might change tomorrow it's a developing market uh, very much, uh, but it does, does seem to be a market that's coming, and I think it's a market that is even, you know, still the opportunity uh, to make some changes in it that might favor what different folks are interested in out of that market. And you can do that at the state level and, and even at the national level. Uh, Colin Peterson uh, from Minnesota was very uh, proactive in getting uh, credits from forestry included in the Waxman Markey Bill that uh, Jeff referred to. So, uh, but really, the, if we talk about carbon and this whole market, we're talking about the, the global carbon cycle. And uh, basically, what happens is uh, as living plants grow, uh, they take carbon out of the atmosphere, and that goes into the wood in the case of trees. Uh, but then, if those trees die, they deteriorate, and that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. Uh, the carbon that's tied up in petroleum uh, was sequestered for millions of years, and you know, in a short period of time, a lot of that has been released. So that's that's part of the concern. There's a natural exchange between oceans in the atmosphere, and that changes as concentrations go up in the atmosphere. That means they go up in the ocean as well, causing some some issues there. And then, as we uh, burn coal for power, that really increases the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. I was